Thank you for the invitation uh, to speak and um, I've, I've been able to drag out a, a title for my seminar that I haven't been brave enough to use before, uh, but I've always wanted to use it. It, uh, it, it appeals to my warped sense of, of humour and I apologise to any people that I've brought here in false pretenses thinking that I've developed a straight banana, but I'm uh, going to talk on something a bit, uh, a bit more boring and that's virus uh, diagnostic strategies. Um, I, I, I like to start with acknowledgements first in this talk because um, a lot of this uh, research was driven by one person. This was uh, Dr. Jenny Vo. I've, I've got Miss Jenny Vo, but she uh, graduated earlier this year. Um, Jenny has uh, gone to Sydney now, where she's now uh, working in a in a medical. Uh, Virology Research Laboratory, which shows that if you get a, a, a good training, you can swap disciplines uh, quite easily. Um, she, uh, as long as uh, myself and a few others, were based at the Ecosciences Precinct, uh, which is uh, across the road uh, or across the river at, at Dutton Park. Um, it hosts uh, some of the animal microbiologists here, I can see in the audience, and also uh, one of the biggest plant pathology uh, laboratories uh, in the country, including um, quite a large group of horticultural plant pathologists uh, from the Centre for Plant Sciences. Um, a, a bit about the banana, um, I, I, because it's such a general audience here, I, I, I tried to give a, a bit, bit more of a background than I'd normally uh, give about the crop. Um, but uh, the banana, as we know it, is actually um, um, a derivative of two wild species, um, Musa acuminata, uh, which we refer to as the A genome, and Musa balbiziana, uh, which we call the B genome. Um, a lot of the cavin uh, a lot of the cultivars are, are, are different, um, uh, different levels of ploidy. Uh, most commonly, they're triploid. Um, the Cavendish banana, which is the most important banana in Australia and also in international uh, trade, is a triple A banana. Uh, whereas the ladyfinger, which has a, a, I guess you'd say, a, a niche market in Australia, is an AAB banana. Um, Musa cumulata, um, its natural distribution is, is New Guinea. Um, it also extends into uh, North Queensland. So if you go uh, along that famous drive from Mossman uh, through to Daintree, uh, sometimes where you see uh, a, a clearing in the rainforest, you'll see uh, Musa acuminata uh, popping up there. That's the uh, natural uh, uh, niche of the banana is that it's a, a coloniser uh, when you get a clearing in a, in a rainforest. It's, a, it's a, a fruit bat and a bird distributed uh, um, fruit and it grows very quickly and fills in those, uh, those gaps in the rainforest. Um, uh, Musa cuminata banksii extends, well its main distribution is in New Guinea and then there's also lots of other uh, subspecies of cuminata in uh, the Indonesian archipelago in the Philippines and in uh, the Malay Peninsula as well. Uh, the bee genome balbiziana is uh, a more northerly uh, banana, its uh, centre of distribution is uh, in uh, northeastern India uh, northern Burma, northern Thailand, and because it uh, tends to grow in more uh, monsoonal areas, it's uh, much more drought tolerant, uh, it's more cold tolerant, um, and it also has uh, much better suckering ability, um, and it also has some very important uh, disease resistance uh, traits as well. So uh, if you look at the five or six hundred different cultivars of bananas, we're, we're quite deprived in Australia that we only really have two or three main cultivars and they're not some of the nicest bananas compared to some of the, the Thai bananas, for example. Uh, they're all combinations of, of the A and the B genome. An important thing is that the banana is essentially sterile. If you cut a banana fruit uh, longitudinally, you'll see the bl black specks. They're the uh, aborted seeds that uh, have, have failed to develop. And therefore, it must be vegetatively propagated, either by tissue culture or, or using suckers. 
which is important for disease control. Um, often it's a, a bit of a standing joke when you say you work on bananas amongst um, uh, other people because um, you know people can't believe that someone would spend their life working on a, on a, a fruit like the banana, but it's actually a, a very important fruit uh, around the world. Um, I've listed the, the four largest producers there, um, India, China, the Philippines and, and Ecuador. And poor old Australia comes a, a, a lowly 38th in, in the ranking and, and usually we're sort of lumped together with the rest of uh, Oceania with uh, less than 0.1% uh, of, the, of the world production. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, dessert bananas, so I don't have to explain those, but um, plantains, there's no botanical distinction between a banana and a plantain. Uh, the only difference is that when a plantain fruit matures, the starch doesn't hydrolyze, and therefore it remains a very hard and starchy food, uh, fruit that's used for cooking. And I've just put some of the more unusual uses of uh, banana in some of the f photographs. It's actually uh, the Ugandans are some of the biggest uh, producers and eaters of uh, bananas in the world, and they make a beer. Uh, they have special beer bananas. Um, that they mash up uh, bananas in these canoe-type structures. Um, they add a bit of sorghum to it and they um, ferment away and they make a, um, a, a banana beer out of it. And also uh, manila hemp, some of you might have heard of manila hemp ropes, uh, that's derived from the fibre of uh, Musa textilis, uh, which is a, a species that comes from the Philippines and a species that they've uh, very reluctantly uh, released out of the Philippines because they wanted to sort of maintain some ownership of, of that plant. Uh, the Australian banana industry, as I, as I said, is, is uh, fairly small and it's limited to, um, uh, well, two main cultivars, um, a, the Cavendish subgroup of cultivars and, and Ladyfinger. Uh, the great majority of the industry, 93% of it is based uh, in the wet tropics of, of Australia, where about uh, uh, 12,000 hectares of, of bananas are grown, uh, almost all Cavendish and there's about 200 farmers. Uh, there's a smaller uh, subtropical industry um, from um, Bundaberg down to um, Coffs Harbour, which is historically where bananas uh, first grew, but now this industry is, is diminishing as the, as the tropical industry uh, gets larger and larger. And there's also minor production areas in, in Carnarvon in Western Australia and uh, there is, I think, still one commercial producer in, in, in Darwin. Um, our bananas are only for the domestic market. Um, we don't allow any imports, and we can't produce bananas at a, uh, um, and it, uh, trade them at a price that would make them viable on the uh, export market. Now, um, if you count all the different species, uh, there's something like 20 or, or 30 different viruses that uh, uh, affect banana and uh, a bit of a boast, um, more than 50% of them have, have been described by our um, virology group um, at, at DAF uh, slash uh, the Centre for Plant Sciences. Um, of these, banana bunchy top virus, which is the top right-hand photograph, is, is the most devastating, and, and plants that are infected by that virus don't produce uh, any fruit. Um, but after that, uh, arguably the most uh, important of the viruses are the, the banana streak viruses. Um, I, I use the plural um, there for the, for the name because it's actually a, a cryptic species complex. Um, cryptic species in, in that um, you can't readily distinguish the different species of virus uh, by looking at uh, symptoms on the plant or uh, virion morphology, but only by uh, DNA sequence analyses. And uh, we've, we've divided them into uh, a, a number of different species, uh, some of which occur in Australia and some of which are exotic. Um, viruses um, are readily transmitted in, in vegetative propagules uh, by uh, division of the plant uh, to produce suckers and in tissue culture. And therefore, the single most uh, important method of control is to use a strict, uh, strict quarantine regulations. Uh, we've got a very tightly regulated banana industry in Australia where it's divided into a number of different quarantine zones and you can't 
uh, easily move bananas between the different quarantine zones um, to prevent uh, the viruses moving from one, one zone to another. And we also have a nursery accreditation scheme uh, called QBAN, and that's uh, an accreditation scheme for uh, tissue culture producers. And to comply with that scheme, they need to have their uh, uh, mother plants that are initiated into tissue culture um, uh, 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 tested for, for virus status. Now, my interest for a long time has been uh, banana streak virus. Um, you can see in the top right-hand side there is, uh, it's got uh, bullet-shaped um, virus particles. Um, it's referred to often as, uh, as a pararetrovirus. Uh, some of you might have heard of, of retroviruses, such as uh, human, Im human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, well, the difference, uh, differences between a pararetrovirus uh, and a retrovirus are, are, are reasonably subtle. The main difference is, is uh, whether a, a double-stranded DNA, DNA genome is encapsulated in the particle or whether it's a single-stranded RNA genome. But both retroviruses and pararetroviruses cycle between double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA during their replication cycle. Um, importantly for us, it, it has a very simple genome organisation uh, in that a lot of the enzymatic and structural uh, proteins are produced in the P3 polyprotein as one large um, uh, polyprotein that's cleaved into mature uh, products, proteins, through the action of, a, uh, of an enzyme called an aspartic protease that is produced by, a virus, by the virus. Now, um, it's, it's widely regarded um, as uh, this uh, species complex uh, bears fee of, of being one of the most challenging of the um, banana infecting viruses to detect. One of the reasons is that uh, it occurs in uh, both endogenous and exogenous forms. When I say endogenous, I mean that the viral DNA has actually been captured in the genome, the nuclear genome of the banana plant. And it can also uh, exist in an exogenous form, which is a freely replicating form in the cytoplasm of, uh, of the cell and be transmitted by insects between plants. Um, this capture of the DNA into the plant genome uh, is, is very ancient. It's been estimated to have occurred uh, about 640,000 years ago uh, for, for two of the species that have been uh, ca captured in the banana genome. And if you like, it's accidental. Um, the banana, and any organism for that matter, is um, subject to a lot of mutagens that cause double-stranded DNA breaks um, uh, in the chromosomes. Double-stranded DNA breaks are, are very lethal mutations often. Um, and the plant or animal has a, a mechanism of, of repairing and joining back these double-stranded DNA breaks. And often, when this occurs, it will pull in extraneous DNA from, the, uh, from around the nucleus to act as, if you like, putty or filler DNA to, to help heal the, heal the breaks uh, in the DNA. Uh, BSV replicates in the nucleus, so it's a, it's a ready source of extraneous DNA that can be pulled in uh, to repair uh, these double-stranded DNA breaks. Uh, this is, I, I guess, of interest in, in many respects. Um, one is that it can tell you that they're essentially molecular fossils of the viruses. You can look at the, the structure of the viruses um, as they were integrated about um, you know, 600,000 years to millions of years uh, ago. And, and secondly, they can um, be excised and um, begin replicating again. So they can be a source of infection. Um, where the endogenous BSV can jump out of the host genome and start replicating, and so you can get a virus infection from new. Um, the main problem uh, with detection is that you can't just use straight PCR um, because you can't tell between an actively replicating form of the virus and um, uh, just a latent dead molecule of the viral DNA in the nuclear genome. Um, the other problem with detection is that uh, we've got 10 or more species of BSV, so you need one very um, broad diagnostic assay or lots of parallel assays to detect all the different species. And symptom expression is sporadic and the virus titer is, is, is very low. So um, 
when Jenny started doing her PhD, um, we were in a situation where um, we use immunocapture PCR. There's a, a, a diagram on the right hand side here to explain what um, immunocapture PCR. Basically, it's taking advantage of the specificity of am antibodies to capture the virus particles to the PCR tube and then you wash away the sap components and you can undertake PCR on those uh, trapped virus particles. And by utilising antibodies, you can dis distinguish between those uh, DNA molecules that form part of a virus particle and those DNA molecules that are, are, are part of the, the host genome. However, there's a, a world shortage of, of anti-sera to all um, bears fee species and, and some serotypes uh, are not represented at all. Uh, the reason for this is it's an extremely difficult virus to purify and it, some of them have very restricted distributions, e.g. Central Africa, where the equipment needed to do the purifications is not available. So she set about to characterise the, the coat protein um, of, of banana streak virus. Um, uh, unfortunately, you can't predict where cleavage will occur uh, by the aspartic protease, so you have to... Uh, Predict it, um, perhaps not predict it, work it out empirically where cleavage has occurred. She wanted to map the distribution of linear epitopes uh, to work out new strategies to developing anti sera and to investigate the use of recombinant antibodies for detection. So, um, this, this slide sort of neatly summarises probably the hardest um, part of her, uh, her PhD was actually getting really good quality virus preparations. I, I sometimes put up a, a slide of a Popeye, of Popeye the cartoon character, just to illustrate the muscles she had to develop in her arms to sort of mash up a kilogram of leaves, banana leaves, uh, to get good virus preparations. But she was able to get very pure preparations and running uh, the viruses out on an STS page gel, she was able to identify uh, putative coat proteins and also a putative uh, minor virion associated protein. So that was a, a tremendous achievement in itself. Uh, the, she then subject uh, the, the, the coat proteins to some uh, uh, neat mass spectrometry um, uh, techniques that allowed her to um, identify where in the polyprotein the, the coat protein occurred. She did uh, uh, de novo peptide sequencing and she did also uh, N-terminal sequencing, and so she was able to quite precisely define uh, what the coat protein was. She found uh, in the previous slide, I um, showed that there were uh, two uh, CP isoforms here. Um, she was able to get quite good evidence that uh, these isoforms were as essentially the same, except that they had slightly different uh, N-termini. Um, so the position where cleavage, there were alternative cleavage sites um, uh, utilised by the, the enzyme there, giving the different sizes. She also did some uh, modelling to look at the structure, and she found uh, homologies with uh, the retroviral domains, uh, namely she was able to identify a highly structured um, CA domain, a uh, capsid protein domain in the middle, a nuclear capsid protein domain, and importantly, what we call the N-terminal domain, which is uh, uh, intrinsically disordered. By this I mean that it doesn't form any uh, defined uh, structure. Its structure is actually uh, determined by what protein partner it interacts with, it's a bit like a, uh, a lock and uh, a, a key in a lock where the shape of the lock is determined by the shape of the key. So depending, uh, uh, sorry, the shape of the key is determined by the shape of the lock. So depending on what lock uh, was binding to the key, the key can change uh, in structure. Uh, this is, uh, finding this region, it's probably a signaling region of the, of the coat protein. Um, allowing the virus to interact with its cellular environment and also its, uh, its, its uh, mealybug vector. But it, uh, importantly, it was a, a, a site that we later showed uh, that contained many linear epitopes. 
and I'll talk about that uh, in the next set of slides. Now, uh, for those not familiar with uh, immuno immunology, um, uh, uh, antibodies are produced by um, all animals as part of the uh, uh, defense system against um, any foreign bodies or, or, or pathogens. An antibody has a very specific interaction, usually with a protein, and the part of the protein that it binds to is called the uh, antigen. So antigen and antibody are, are, are sort of partners in the, in the immune system. Uh, uh, the, e e sorry, the epitope is a part of the antigen that the antibody uh, binds to. You can have two types of uh, epitopes. You can have a linear epitope or a conformational epitope. Uh, a linear epitope is just determined by the, the, the primary amino acid sequence. So it's you know, sort of having five or six amino acids in a row that are recognised by the antibody. A, a conformational epitope, uh, as many of, all, of you will know, proteins are actually three-dimensional structures that uh, fold in, in complex ways. Uh, a conformational epitope is an epitope uh, consisting of different segments of protein uh, that are brought together by the folding of the protein. So these conformational epitopes are, 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 are dependent on proper folding of the, of the protein. She was uh, looking for uh, linear epitopes, so they're uh, epitopes that are just uh, determined by the uh, primary amino acid sequence. So she used something called a, a PEP scan assay. Uh, nowadays you can just uh, log on to a website and, and order chemically synthesized uh, peptide, peptides of say uh, 16 amino acids long. Uh, you can also uh, attach biotin molecules uh, to the bottom of these uh, 16 uh, peptides. Uh, the uh, biotin molecules have a very strong interaction with streptavidin so it allows you to orient um, the peptides so they uh, bind to a bo bottom of an ELISA plate uh, uh, and sort of project into the, in, into the well of the plate. You can then react that library of peptides uh, with a, a, an antiserum, a, a batch of polyclonal antibodies that you've got, and see which uh, peptides react with the antibodies that you've already produced. And in that way, you can assay for which part of the protein um, binds uh, to the antibodies that you've produced in, in traditional ways. She did this uh, assay, and it, it, it worked um, um, incredibly well, actually. Um, it was a case of um, really rapid results uh, towards the end of her PhD. But she found that there were three uh, very very immunodominant linear epitopes at the very end terminus of, of the coat protein. And if you can remember back to the structure um, of, of, of the coat protein, this was the uh, intrinsically disordered uh, region of, of the coat protein. So this was uh, uh, really quite an outstanding result um, and we were uh, very happy at this point. Um, I thought I had another slide there. I've lost it. Um, we've continued this work uh, with Nerna, uh, who's an honours student in the audience, and she showed that this is a, a, a general phenomenon for all, all BSV species. Uh, she showed that the end terminus uh, of, of the coat protein contains the linear epi major linear epitopes for four other BSV species. We then got onto the, the website again and dialed up um, a couple of... Uh, uh, more synthetic uh, peptides. Uh, we took E1 and E2. If I go back to the previous slide, these are the two uh, linear ep peptides that contain the two major linear ep epitopes and also uh, E3 um, here. So we resynthesized uh, these peptides and this time uh, peptides uh, by themselves are not particularly immunogenic, but um, the trick used is to conjugate them to a uh, carrier protein called uh, keyhole limpet hemocyanin. The reason keyhole limpet is just the limpet that occurs on the rocky shorelines of, of the coast. The reason that's used as a carrier protein is that it's very immunogenic. 
and also supposedly antibodies made against the keyhole limpet hemocyanin don't cross-react with your animal or uh, plant of interest. Um, so it's, a, if you like, a, a, a neutral carrier uh, protein for the peptides. Uh, she produced uh, uh, antibodies against uh, E1, E2 and E3 and uh, in a plate-trapped antigen ELISA where the, the virus particle was bound to the bottom of ELISA uh, plate, she found that she got a very, very strong um, reaction uh, with these uh, antibodies that had been made against the, uh, uh, the peptide. So um, that was a, a, um, a, you know, a very, very good advance in, in, uh, in having new strategies to produce uh, antisera. Interestingly, the um, E3, uh, which is the yellow line at the bottom um, here, that didn't give a very good uh, uh, antibody response. Uh, but when we uh, did some modelling of the coat protein, um, and I mentioned before that there were uh, very distant um, relationships between banana streak virus and hum human in immunodeficiency virus, she was able to use the... Um, uh, the 3D, solved 3D structure of human immunodeficiency virus to actually model um, the coat protein of banana streak virus because there are actually very ancient um, homologies between uh, the, the, the two coat proteins. And she mapped the position of the epitopes um, on to this 3D model. And you can see here that E1 and E2 are exposed at the very tip of the protein, which is surf expo surface exposed um, on, on, on the virus particle, whereas E3 is, uh, this is hit here where it's not uh, disguised at all by the protein structure, but it's actually, most of E3 is buried within the, the virus particle, so it's only um, partially exposed on the, on the, on the surface of the, uh, of the protein. So, um, that sort of seems to give a good explanation why uh, epi epitope 3 didn't work so well uh, as an immunogen and uh, uh, for producing antibodies for, for virus detection. And again, she did some electron microscope, microscopy and you can actually um, visualise the antibodies um, binding to the virus particle. And you get this sort of furry outline to the virus particle uh, where the antibodies bind to it, showing again that there was uh, uh, a fairly strong um, uh, interaction between these uh, anti peptide antibodies and the surface of the virus particle. And the final thing she, she looked at, um, this was quite an enormous um, PhD. In fact, I, th I think one of the comments of the referees was that it was probably equivalent to two PhDs that I made her do. Uh, was that uh, she developed recombinant antibodies. Um, many of you probably can remember from your high school immunology that antibodies uh, are, are Y-shaped. The part of the antibody that um, binds to the antigen is the very tips of the Y molecule. Um, they're called uh, variable light and variable he heavy chain. In a normal antibody, they're held together by non-covalent linkages, disulfide bonds. That is the smallest part of the antibody that will bind to the antigen. You don't need all these other parts to have a specific interaction um, with the antigen. So you can clone out these uh, light and heavy chains. Because you're taking them away from the, the complete antibody, you have to have some kind of uh, linkage a flexible peptide chain that holds the two parts together, otherwise they won't interact with each other, with each other um, to, 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 to form a, a sort of a, a binding complex. So um, what she did um, was she prepared her, her virus. Um, we chose the chicken as, as the model. Um, we again outsourced this work to the IMVS in, in, in Adelaide. Um, they injected our banana streak virus into the chicken. Um, they did three, three or so injections. Um, they uh, killed the chicken for us. Um, <laughs> I always love all the euphemisms for killing, like euthanized or exsanguinated the chicken, but in reality it was killed. And you take out the, the spleen, which contains all the uh, 
uh, cells producing um, the, the, the antibodies. Uh, she cloned uh, the fragments, uh, just a total population of the antibody genes out of, out of the spleen. Um, gets quite complicated for the non-molecular biologists here. She displayed these antibody genes on the, on a, on the surface of a, a bacterial virus, a bacteriophage, and uh, made a library, just a, a library of the total antibody genes in the chicken. Then uh, you're able to uh, produce the um, bacteriophage particles and display the antibodies on the very tip of the uh, uh, bacteriophage uh, particle. Um, these bacteriophages, because they're carrying the antibody genes, will react with the antigen. Um, by doing uh, several um, rounds of biopanning, you're able to enrich for those bacterial bacteriophages that are carrying the antibodies that will bind to ba uh, banana streak virus. So she did that, um, where she did biopanning uh, and an enrichment. So you're basically selecting for those uh, phage particles carrying the uh, antibody of, of interest, and you're washing away uh, all the ones that uh, don't uh, bind to banana streak virus. And with each round of uh, biopanning, she was able to uh, get a stronger and a stronger ELISA reaction, indicating that she was uh, selecting for binders to banana streak virus. From once you have uh, pure clonal populations of, of, of the phage, you can then, uh, using a number of molecular tricks, uh, uh, take out uh, the, the antibody genes um, and look at the binding properties of, of uh, individual um, clones. And she select, uh, selected quite a number uh, that uh, appeared to react quite strongly uh, with banana streak virus. Um, she seemed to get some heterogeneity in the, in the binding properties of these uh, antibodies. Um, some appeared to react with uh, uh, two species, others with uh, three species of banana streak virus. So that looks quite promising for us. So uh, to, to uh, sort of complete my talk or finalise it, um, uh, we want to expand our studies to, to new, new BSV species. Um, we need to um, produce these antibodies, single chain variable fragments, as uh, soluble proteins so that they can be used in, in, in diagnostic assays. Um, we want to uh, develop uh, antibody arrays so we can simultaneously uh, detect um, different species of banana streak virus. And we also want to explore new diagnostic platforms uh, such as Luminex. So we creep along um, doing some of these uh, next steps with the uh, dribs and drabs of uh, money we get. And funny, I'd like to finish with acknowledgements. Um, uh, this work started off with the CRC for National Plant Biosecurity. Um, it's continued with the new Horticultural Australia Banana Plant Protection uh, Program, and I also used a new start, uh, staff startup um, grant to, to generate the uh, peptide antisera. And we thank our international colleague, Ben Lockhart, uh, for assistance in, in development of the purification method. And I'll leave my talk there with questions. So thank you.